coming up on this episode of The Folklorist. A miraculous event changes the course of a battle. Unprecedented weather wreaks havoc throughout the world. And three prisoners of war devise an ingenious escape plan. Journey with me now as we explore these fascinating tales on The Folklorist. It's August 22nd, 1914, and World War I is just two weeks old as the British forces are on their way to assist the French military in their defense against the advancing German army. Led by General Sir John French, the British Expeditionary Force, an elite military unit, soon arrived in the southern Belgian town of Mons. There, they would support France's Fifth Army, which was suffering heavy casualties and was on the verge of defeat. As they took up their defensive positions, they soon found themselves outnumbered two to one. If they couldn't stop the German army, northern France would be lost. But as the bullets began to fly, France's fifth army unexpectedly withdrew from the battlefield, leaving the British right flank exposed and vulnerable. As the battle waged on, the German army was closing in on the British forcing General French to give the order to retreat. Although his troops were exhausted, they fell back in preparation for the German onslaught. And it was at that moment, amidst the heat and the clamor of the cannonade, that the British knew the final surge was looming. The soldiers turned to each other with knowing eyes as the German noose tightened. Some dropped to their knees in prayer. Others sang songs about the world they were about to leave behind and the things that reminded them of home. But as the final moment drew near, one soldier recalled something rather odd. He was reminded of an image he had seen etched onto a dinner plate. It was a depiction of St. George, the patron saint of archers. It is said that St. George came to the aid of the British in the Battle of Agincourt during the Hundred Years' War. And just underneath that image was an inscription that read, May St. George be a present help to the English. The frightened soldier began to whisper this phrase over and over again. May St. George be a present help to the English. And as he spoke those words, he was startled by a booming voice. Array! 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 The soldiers looked up. And to their amazement, they saw a shadowy line of what appeared to be longbowmen just beyond their trenches. The bowmen pulled, aimed, and all at once, released. The apparition stunned the German troops. The sun went dark, and a deadly rain of arrows fell upon them. The lull in the action gave the British soldiers enough time to clear the battlefield and escape certain defeat. The assault by the mighty German army had been repelled. Upon examination of the bodies, there were no marks left on the men by the arrows. But despite the setback, the German army regrouped and continued their relentless march towards Paris. And although Mons was lost, the soldiers considered the battle to be a victory. Some would even go on to tell the tale of the longbowmen, who, in their darkest hour, had come to save them. A few weeks later, a story entitled The Bowmen by journalist Arthur Macon was published in the London Daily News. The story about the amazing encounter with its miraculous outcome quickly spread throughout Britain, boosting national morale. The publication created controversy, as it was never released as fiction. Many questioned the validity of the story, claiming that the divine intervention was nothing more than a hoax. But in a sense, the event was insignificant compared to what came out of it. It provided hope for countless people who had to endure the lasting effects of a brutal war that no one could have ever imagined. So whether the story is about an actual event or a contrived legend, it doesn't really matter. We still remember the Angels of Mons.
Is there some folklore in your town? Well, let us know about it. Send us an email, folklorist at newtv.org. We'd love to hear about it. Did you know during World War I, a company of British soldiers disappeared while they attacked the Turkish army? They rushed into a wooded area that was shrouded by thick clouds, and when the fog lifted, they were gone. British Commander-in-Chief General Hamilton reported, there happened a very mysterious thing. They charged into the forest and were lost to sight and sound. Not one of them ever came back. Summertime. After a long winter, we relish being outdoors, wearing light clothing, and taking in the warm weather. But what if summer never came? That's what happened in 1816. Some would call it the poverty year, the year without wine, or the year of the beggar. But we would come to know it as the year without a summer. Spring, 1816, a mysterious dry fog has blanketed the northern hemisphere, dimming the sun and causing a drastic environmental change that would impact people around the world. As Europe recuperated from the Napoleonic Wars, torrential rainfall caused major flooding, displacing thousands of people from their homes. Food was becoming scarce as grain warehouses were looted in Britain and France. When armed laborers marched with flags that said bread or blood, England suspended all taxes. The violence was so bad that some governments would declare it a national emergency. Winter seemed to have come early, or maybe it never left. May of 1816, Mary Godwin, philosopher Percy Shelley, romantic poet Lord Byron, author John William Polidori, and Mary's stepsister Claire Claremont vacationed together at a villa in Switzerland. But due to the weather, they were forced to stay indoors. They passed the time enjoying each other's company by sitting around the fireplace, talking late into the night. Mary said that it proved to be a wet, ungenial summer, and incessant rain often confined us to the house for days. One evening, they started telling frightening stories. This inspired Lord Byron to hold a writing contest where everyone would write their own supernatural tale. Byron would write an ominous poem entitled The Darkness, describing the dreary weather and the internal feelings it evoked. John Polidori wrote the classic novel The Vampire. Shortly afterwards, in a dream, Mary Godwin conceived of a grotesque creature created from a strange scientific experiment. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then show signs of life and stir with an uneasy half vital motion. With Percy Shelley's encouragement, she expanded this tale into her first novel, Frankenstein. While they were trapped inside writing novels, across the Atlantic, a real-life horror story was emerging as famine, epidemic, and social unrest spread across the continent. It all began with a frost, which would ice over the landscape every month of the year. In May, sleet fell in New England, killing off most of the seedlings that were planted. The snow drifts in the north from the previous winter had remained two feet deep late into spring. But the strangest part of the infamous summer of 1816 was the cold snap in early June. In some areas, the temperatures dipped nearly 50 degrees in one day. Conditions turned colder and the rain began to freeze. Edward Holyoke, an amateur meteorologist, kept detailed records throughout his life. And on June 7th, he recorded that the weather was exceedingly cold, ground frozen hard, and squalls of snow throughout the day. Icicles, 12 inches long in the shade at noonday. Massachusetts physician William Bentley wrote on June 12th, In few seasons, we have heard more bitter complaints against cold weather than since June has come in. Then, on June 23rd, to Bentley's amazement, a high of 99 degrees was recorded in Waltham, nearly 60 degrees warmer than it was two weeks earlier. But by July 8th, there was a frost once again, leaving Bentley absolutely perplexed with no plausible scientific explanation. The rest of the month was just as unpredictable, with dry conditions leading to droughts. This, coupled with the frigid temperatures, began to affect New England harvests, and many farmers were in financial ruin. Thomas Jefferson recorded the severe weather in his diary, frustrated over the crop failures that sent him further into debt. 
During the first three weeks of August, conditions remained very dry until August 20th when a cold front came storming in. Even the astute weather observer Holyoke was confused. On August 17th, he said that the crop outlook is better than he could have anticipated. But on August 21st, he wrote in a tenser hand, the fields were as empty and as white as October. The replanted crops in New England were now wiped out. And because of the hay shortage, farmers couldn't feed their livestock and they had to sell them. With crop failures and food shortages, many New Englanders left for the better growing climate of the Midwest. Scientists were baffled by the strange weather, but the truth wouldn't come to light until the 20th century. When scientists began to look back at the previous years leading up to 1816, many volcanoes around the world had erupted, including Indonesia's Mount Tambora, which exploded in April of 1815. The volcano's massive ash clouds had obscured the sun to such an extent that 1816 would become the second coldest year in over four centuries. While the year without a summer caused starvation, disease, dislocation, and panic, it also resulted in agricultural and technological advances. The lack of oats to feed horses inspired the German inventor Karl Dreyas to research new ways of horseless transportation, paving the way for the invention of the bicycle. German chemist Justus von Liebig discovered that nitrogen was an essential plant nutrient and was dubbed the father of the fertilizer industry. So on the next nice day, Go outside, enjoy yourself, have some fun, because you never know, this could be a year without a summer. There's more to come on The Folklorist. Did you know, drought brought on by the year without a summer caused the disease known as cholera to mutate into a deadlier strain. While battling this pandemic, significant advances were made in the areas of public health and medicine that continue to be used to this day. Disclaimer. With folklore, sometimes the biggest casualty is fact. But please, keep watching. During World War II, over 10,000 Allied Air Force servicemen were detained at a prisoner of war camp 100 miles southeast of Berlin at a place called Stalag III. The German Air Force who controlled the camp maintained a degree of professional respect for them, but if any prisoner dared to stray over the knee-high warning wire, the guards wouldn't hesitate to shoot. However, that didn't stop prisoners from planning their escape. Some established relationships with the guards by bribing them with chocolate, coffee, or cigarettes in exchange for vital information like local maps, travel documentation, and railway schedules. But Stalag III was no ordinary prison camp. It was built on 60 acres of sandy soil and was surrounded by a five-mile perimeter fence. The prisoners lived in raised barracks, and the Germans planted listing devices across the yard to monitor digging activity. And even if they were to dig a tunnel, the distance was so far, it could take months. The prisoners needed a plan that would bring them closer to the fence. It's the summer of 1943. Three prisoners, Oliver Philpot, Michael Codner, and Eric Williams understood this challenge and approached their ranking officer, Roger Bushell, known simply as X, with an idea. X had been held in various POW camps since the beginning of the war and was the notorious mastermind behind several escape plans himself. X listened to their ingenious plan, inspired by the legend of the Trojan horse. They proposed to construct a vaulting horse in order to cover the opening of a tunnel entrance close to the fence. As a diversion, the other inmates would then vault over the horse to mask the vibration of the tunneling. The wooden horse would be constructed from salvaged plywood from Red Cross parcels, and each morning they planned to move it out into the compound with a man hidden inside. X loved the plan and gave the trio the go-ahead. He began recruiting skilled prisoners to assist them with all facets of the escape, but there was much to do to ensure its success. Teams of men were busy forging identification documents which were required to travel through war zones. Tailors were preparing clothing for the escapees so they would blend in with local residents once they reached the outside. And the prisoners developed an elaborate signaling system 
to alert the crew when the guards were approaching. <laughs> The horse was finally ready, but before the digging could commence, they had to fool the guards. They introduced their new routine by intentionally tipping over the wooden horse several times, blaming it on a clumsy vaulter. This caught the attention of the Germans, who meticulously examined the horse. But after several days of inspection, the Germans had found nothing suspicious and soon ignored them. They had taken the bait, and so digging began. Each day, the team would carry the wooden horse out to the same spot with one man hidden inside. The men dug with crude spades, formed from wooden bowls and old cans, whatever they could find, and their only source of light came from a single dimly lit candle. They reinforced the walls with their bed planks and placed the dirt from the tunnel into canvas bags, hanging them inside the horse. At the end of the day, the digger would carefully replace the topsoil to mask their effort so the ground appeared unbroken. Then, the vaulters would cease their exercise and carry the wooden horse back into the hut. Day after day, the men toiled both above and below the surface, with conditions worsening by the hour. Inside the dark and constricting tunnel, the men struggled to breathe, and the continual overexertion from vaulting, mixed with the heat and humidity, was taking its toll. But after eight long weeks of digging, they had only tunneled 40 feet and were physically and emotionally exhausted. Time was running out, and the plan was now in jeopardy. One day, Codner was down in the tunnel when all of a sudden, disaster struck. The ceiling began to give way. Codner panicked, but before he had time to signal the others, the roof collapsed. The cave was so severe that the surface of the ground was broken, opening a hole and exposing the tunnel. Luckily, one of the vaulters spotted the hole before the guards did. He dove on top of it, pretending he twisted his ankle, giving Codner just enough time to shore up the tunnel below. Because of their quick response, the plan was still intact. And in order to speed up the process, X agreed they'd now send two men down into the tunnel. Finally, on October 29, 1943, 114 days after they had begun digging, the tunnel was complete. But now it was a race against time. The train schedules and the moonlight needed to guide them would be changing soon. They had to make a break for it, and fast. That very morning, Codner was left inside the tunnel to burrow the last few vital feet. But they had to account for his absence during the midday headcount. So the other prisoners shuffled around, confusing the guards who didn't notice that Codner was missing. It's now 5 p.m. This time, three men would be carried out on the horse. Williams and Philpot would be heading towards their freedom, while the other prisoner would be left behind to close up the hatch and eliminate any evidence of the tunnel's existence. The three escapees anxiously awaited until dusk before they could exit the tunnel. But as they were about to escape, suddenly a sentry was pacing right above their heads. This was it. All of those months of planning and effort wasted as their elaborate plot was about to be exposed. And just as all hope was about to be lost, a commotion was heard back at the camp. The guard left to investigate, luckily, was part of a pre-planned diversion created by X. As soon as the guard was out of sight, they darted out of the tunnel and into the safety of the woods. They had done the impossible. They had escaped from the inescapable camp. The three men now had to begin their long journey home by making their way out of Germany to the Baltic Sea by rail, where they hoped to reach neutral territory. But they had to split up in order to increase their chances of survival. Philpot had decided to set off on his own route. So there, under the darkness of the night, they shook each other's hands and said what could be their final goodbyes. And with that, they went on their separate ways. Williams and Codner made their way to Denmark, where they managed to sneak aboard a small fishing boat that was about to set sail for Sweden. But before it was allowed to leave port, the ship had to be inspected by German soldiers and their dogs. The ship's captain, who was sympathetic to the stowaways, distracted the guards with schnapps. Meanwhile, Philpot bought a train ticket to Poland and climbed on board. He was soon challenged by a policeman who fooled him with a false identity card. He arrived in Poland the next morning and hid in a coal bin on a ship bound for Sweden. All three men now had freedom within their grasp. 
But back at Stalag 3, the escape had quickly been discovered, and the prisoners who helped the men were put under lockdown. X was thrown into solitary confinement, but all their sacrifices would serve a purpose. Codner and Williams arrived safely in Sweden, where they immediately went to the British consulate. There, to their astonishment, was Oliver Philpott, who had arrived a few days earlier. It was an emotional reunion as they recounted their miraculous escape. Despite the incredible odds, Michael Codner, Eric Williams, and Oliver Philpott had made it all the way back home to England, where their arrival was widely celebrated. It's said that when X was released from solitary confinement, he grinned after being informed that their escape was successful. At war's end, the account of their escape was published in the book The Wooden Horse, but their incredible story of survival would provide hope to prisoners of war and those who awaited their return. Hi, my name is Folklore Smuha, and I'm going to tell you a story about Evelyn Hillary. Evelyn Hillary was born on July 20, 1919 in Auckland, New Zealand, and took up mountain climbing. In 1953, he became the first, along with Tenzing Norgay, to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Seven climbing teams tried to climb Mount Everest before them, but all of them failed. Edmund and Tenzing celebrated the arrival by shaking hands. Hillary later participated in expeditions to the South Pole and was among the first to reach the top of Mount Herschel. He also cultivated resources for the people of Nepal. He died on January 11, 2008. Although he rose to great heights climbing Mount Everest, Edmund Hillary described himself as a small and rather lonely child. Edmund Hillary has once said, it is not the mountain we conquer but ourselves. Did you know, after the wooden horse, X organized the largest escape attempt made during World War II. On the evening of March 24th, 76 men broke out from Stalag III. All but three were captured, and sadly, 50 men, including X, were executed. Today, if you visit Sagan, Poland, the site of the camp, there is a memorial that commemorates the Great Escape. Angelic archers come to the aid of a besieged army. Volcanoes cause summer to turn as cold as winter. And three men tunnel out from a German POW camp. These are the stories that are passed on through the generations. We are the folklorists, and this is the new history. Till next time. Thank you.